This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Welcome back, everyone, to Wells Tech. This is episode 420 for Tuesday, November 24th, 2015. And my name is Sally Draper. I'm one of the co-hosts of Wells Tech. And I'm privileged today to be joined by Gail Potratz coming to us from New London, Wisconsin. Good afternoon, Gail. Hi, Sally. Hi, everyone. So nice to have you here today. And uh, our longtime listeners and viewers will know that something must be amiss at Wells Tech and Wells Tech land uh, as Martin Spriggs is not with us. Um, normally, Martin starts off the show and is um, the regular co host along with me of Wells Tech. And uh, he had uh, some family responsibilities today and was sorry not to be able to join us for this podcast. Um, we wanted to uh, make mention that uh, Martin's father-in-law, Pastor David Whitty, passed away recently and um, just wanted to give a shout out to the entire Whitty family, um, sending our love and condolences as they um, say goodbye to the wonderful um, pastor and friend and um, father and grandfather that he's been to their family and to many um, that he's served throughout the years. And you know what, Gail, it actually has kind of a Wells Tech tie as we talk about Pastor Whitty and his yeah. service. Um, he's actually the voice for a very popular feature on the Wells website. And I have it open on my screen. We actually have a series called Through My Bible uh, on the Wells website. And the Through My Bible series is actually a three-year series where we publish on a daily basis readings from the Bible, and if you listen to the entire three-year series, then you've read the entire Bible. Um, and Pastor Witte, some years ago, took on the project of recording the Through My Bible podcast. So not only can you read the Through My Bible, but you can also listen. And for those of you that do, um, Pastor Witte's voice will be very familiar to you. I brought my um, my phone along, I thought I'd play just a little snippet to remind you of what Through My Bible sounds like. You are listening to Through My Bible in Three Years, published by Northwestern Publishing House and available on www.wells.net. Our reading is John chapter 13, the first 20 verses. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And I'll just pause there, but I'm guessing that many that listen to Wells Tech also take advantage of the Through My Bible series. It's available in the Wells mobile app. Um, you can sign up for it via email and everything. And so, like me, you probably are pretty attached to Pastor Witty's voice um, as he has um, voiced that series um, for us here at Wells. And so, I just uh, wanted to you know, express my um, appreciation for his work here on this earth and my joy for his um, his entry into heaven now. And I um, just look forward to seeing him again someday. So thank you, Pastor Witty, for your work. All right, Gail, um, time to dig in. And the reason that we are fortunate to have you joining us on Wells Tech on a regular basis is to talk about education. So maybe give us a little background on what it is that you do there at Emanuel Lutheran School in New London, Wisconsin. Well, I am a utility player like all technology coordinators. We do many things on a daily basis and the things we plan to do usually aren't the things that end up getting done on that day. Um, I think it's appropriate that uh, the class that I teach for Martin Luther College um, is called Coordinating Technology in Education. And our first unit is called Wearing Many Hats. And <laughs> that's exactly what your technology coordinator does. Um, most of us don't have the privilege of being only the technology coordinator for the church and the school. We uh, usually have other responsibilities in the classroom, 
maybe in the coaching area, you know, just all the regular teacher kind of things as well. So lots of things go on every day. Um, um, if I had to go ahead. I was just going to interject that um, that's exactly what we wanted to focus on today. It's a great lead in to our discussion topic where we were going to talk about a day in the life of a tech director. So there in, in New London, you serve as the, the tech director along with those regular teaching responsibilities as well. And we just hope to, um, to learn more about what it is that a tech director does. Maybe there are those in the audience who um, are interested in perhaps possibly um, expanding their teaching responsibilities in that area or have need to have someone in their church or school to do those responsibilities. And uh, just thought it would be an interesting thing to, to um, dig into a little bit today. So, right. yeah. Um, so well, with that focus, a day in the life, what exactly do your days look like with those tech well, director responsibilities? I think if you, if you divide it up, um, if you look at it, um, I like to think it's um, a lot of planning and researching. You have to plan and research. Uh, you, you have to be understand the trends and what's coming out with the hardware software angle. But not only that, also with the teaching, you know, best practices for how to use those things. And, um, you know, just being aware of teaching philosophies and, and what we really want to use technology for within our schools. Um, I've always been a big proponent proponent of talking a lot about those things before you before you get into the technology itself. You know, connecting it to the education is that why why do we need this? How is it going to help us better serve our students? So there's a lot of research uh, really that goes along with that. So you're always planning and researching kind of constantly, um, purchasing. Purchasing is a big thing. It takes time to purchase. It takes time to budget, usually involved with the budget process throughout the year. Um, if your budget is like ours, it might, you might also be in, involved in some fundraising. And mm -hmm. we, we just did our big fundraiser for the year. Um, I, I'm just thrilled. We made like $7,000 making pizzas this year. So That's great. <laughs> I bet it's you so could spend fun. that very quickly, huh? Oh, yeah, it goes quickly. But it's such a fun day. Parents and students and teachers, everyone gets involved. Everyone works together. Um, and everybody really enjoys the day of doing it. And the pizzas are really good. So uh, mm -hmm. it always goes well. We've been doing it for three years now. But I know other people do other kinds of things for fundraising, too. Um, so you're do, doing those kind of things. Then there's, of course, the maintenance, the maintaining of what you already have running while you're, um, you know, looking at adding to, to things that you have running, up and running in your building. So there's the planning uh, and the maintaining and the purchasing. And then you have the phase of all the documentation, you know. Oh, so you're, you're doing, you're do, yeah, right. You're doing keeping track of the inventory of all of your equipment. Um, whether you're doing it just with a spreadsheet or whether you're using, um, you know, an online software package that helps you do that in a, in a nice way. Um, I just use Google Documents for, for the way I do it. I don't use anything else. Um, some schools, of course, if you're in a high school, that would involve uh, your asset management is what they call that. And that would also involve, besides inventory, a lot of times you think about helpline software and things like that that are going to play in there too. Um, we here at Emmanuel don't use that um, that approach, but certainly high schools do. Um, but your documentation then is, you know, your your tech plan, uh, what's your five year plan or your ten year plan, and your tech curriculum. How are you connecting your curriculum and your content areas with your technology? That's a huge thing, and it's always mm -hmm. got to, all these things are always being revised, you know. And then you have to consider professional development of your staff. So a tech director is responsible for either doing that yourself or, or, or providing ways for that to happen for your staff outside uh, of what you have to offer. Um, and, and finally, you know, your own professional development, too, of course, has to be considered. So... Lots and lots of things. What I, it was interesting this year when, when people are 
deciding to call people to be a technology director or when they're working on the budget. It, the question always comes up, often comes up, well, what do they actually do? Which is <laughs> what we're talking about today. So this year, uh, since we're going to be doing some rearranging again um, in the next few years, I decided that I would keep a close tabs for a couple months and just jot down everything I do that related to technology in a day. So um, it, may, it might be kind of interesting. I'm going to open that up for myself here. And if I just pick a day, um, I think you'll probably see all the different things I mentioned kind of show up in a normal day. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, on Thursday, the 3rd of December, uh, September, uh, work, up, work on more setup issues occurring in the use of Google Classroom in grades 7 and 8. Explain the acceptable use policy to the fifth graders. Go in and talk to them, and we talk about the policy, and then they it's a contract that they sign, so they do that. Um, Start work on the Google issue in one of the first in the first grade classroom. They were having an issue uh, later in the day. The second grade classroom had a smart board issue that um, needed some solving. So you take care of that. Then back to sixth grade and go in there and teach them how to get out their new Chromebooks, how to sign in, how to arrange the drive for the year, bookmark some important sites like classroom, which is new to them, and drive. Um, back to more research on the iPad issue, we waffled back and forth between, we are, we are getting 20 iPads next week, I hope, but it's taken quite a while to, to settle on um, that. We I spent a lot of time going back and forth with different tablets, different ideas, looking at the software we wanted to run on them, the apps. Um, so that happened on that day, <laughs> excuse me, that day a little bit. Um, Received and, and filed some more E-rate paperwork. It was time for Form 486 to be handled. So the E-rate thing kind of goes on the edge, um, you know, that's a, another budgetary thing, a way to save money. So you want to be doing that. Um, fixed a voicemail mailbox from the library that said it was full all the time and no one could leave a message. So I've got to reprogram a new mailbox. So that's just a sampling of um, and there was a lot of maintenance on that day. There was some training of students, um, some budgetary things. Um, so just in a sampling, I just picked that day. And a, a lot of the things I talked about did show up in that day. And I think that's a pretty typical day. You, you can't plan for those things. A lot of those things occur, you know, and you have to deal with them on the spur of the moment. It seems um, like you... I'm sorry. Seems like you touch a lot of people in the process as well. So, you know, you talked about students and professional development with the teachers, but I'm guessing there's maybe library staff and software there, church office and school office people. It, it's definitely interaction with a lot of different folks involved. Definitely. Yep. I, I spent a lot of time in the church office. Um, um, and right now we're going through some new equipment there as well. So a lot of training and stuff going on there. We trained um, the church staff and pastors on Google Apps this summer. We still need okay. to do some more, but we were started. So we're really, we're making use of Google Apps now in the, in the church um, offices as well. So uh, that really helps when the whole facility is involved. We've got some good sharing and collaborating going on that wasn't as easily possible before. Um, those are the kind of things that I don't think people think about when they think about what a tech director does. They think you're hooking up computers, you're you know, plugging them in, you're setting them up, that kind of thing. You're setting up the projector every time somebody needs a projector for a, like we had a, re, a lady, an author come today, so she needed certain equipment set up. So. Um, I had that set up for her. Um, you know, so many things, and I don't think people generally think of a lot of them. There's a lot kind of behind the scenes that goes on. And it seems like you somewhat could divide it into two different camps. Um, you mentioned plugging in new computers and things like that. But there's the the hardware side, the more dealing with 
networking and and making sure the hardware is working and troubleshooting and ordering equipment and things like that. Um, and then there's the whole um, support of the, the systems that you're using. So software, websites, um, printing, all kinds of things that, that you have to support yeah. systems wise as well. So you might find someone who's really good at, um, you know, supporting the software side of things who knows nothing about networking. It's, it's, uh, it's probably yeah. a hard bill to fill to have somebody that knows all of that, right. that spectrum. Right. Um, my, the thing I like the best is teaching people, whether it's adults or whether it's kids, teaching people how to use the technology in their learning. That's, that's what I enjoy the most. I have to know the other stuff. Like, like many people, I always say we had to build it so we could use it because mm -hmm. we, you know, we saw the advantage. We saw the power in engaging students with technology in their learning. And so therefore we had, we had to, um, learn how to put it together. And over the years, I guess that's basically the people in, in my generation and, and today yet are, are still doing that, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's usually a teacher in an individual building um, that is willing to take that on um, for the benefit of um, themselves, first of all, and then it spreads out. Definitely. So that's how it goes a lot. I'll do a quick shout out for the Martin Luther College uh, Graduate Studies Continuing Ed area. They do have an educational technology certificate available um, for those who are interested. Um, lots of different um, courses involved. It's not a real hefty certificate. It doesn't take a lot of credits to complete, um, but I do think it, it kind of covers a lot of the spectrum. Gail, you teach in this um, in this area, I believe, don't you? Yeah, mm -hmm. I do the EDT three and five. Is okay. It? It's a, there's the graduate, the graduate program, and the undergraduate program that courses taught to both of those at the same time, mm -hmm. which I used to find I used to find that quite challenging, um, but this last time that I taught it. I had uh, three very gifted MLC students that were in the course. And those people um, definitely someday should be teaching and being a technology coordinator because they were really on the, right, on the right path for that. And I'm so happy to see more people coming out of um, MLC with that uh, as a goal. And they're taking these courses to prepare themselves for that opportunity. Um, when for a long time there was never really people knew we needed technology coordinators but there wasn't really any educational program out there for them those people that are in my age bracket you know we we learned on our own and we went to workshops and we um and then finally way later way later i decided i might as well find a program and and take it since i was already doing all the things <laughs> that mm -hmm. i would be learning about so that that everybody agreed there should be some place that teaches about what should we teach them. And for a while that was such a conundrum, but eventually it kind of got straightened out a little bit, but you still have people that are very basically computer science type people who are learning how to do the infra infrastructure and how to do the networking and be a network administrator and, you know, that side of things. And then you have the other people who are um, more, uh, prone to um, knowing how to use it in, in learning. So those mm -hmm. two things, you know, if you got a person that can do both of those, count your blessings, because uh, that, that is really a great technology leader to have. Um, most of the time, people lean one way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. You know. Well, I do also want to make mention, Gail, that I found a resource that's been out on the Wells Tech Wiki for a while, but it's an actual addendum to a call for an information technology coordinator. It may need to be updated or whatever, but or customized maybe to fit particular calls um, that are out there. But it does kind of cover some of those um, different areas that that a tech coordinator is called on to um, to 
assist with. And so if you're um, listening to the show and perhaps considering adding a technology coordinator to your school staff's responsibilities somehow, um, you might check out this addendum as a starting place to, to actually including some of those responsibilities in the call that's being issued. I thought that was really helpful. That looks like a very handy document for a congregation to be aware of, mm -hmm. especially if they're calling for the first time, you know. Definitely. And then um, we'd probably be remiss if we didn't talk about some of the, um, what we might call the PLN type um, resources that are available via the internet um, oh. to enhance your personal learning, your personal learning network. And, and there's many different ways to do this. I know back mm -hmm. in the day, Twitter was kind of all the buzz as the PLN location, your personal learning network out on Twitter. But now there's lots of different ways to connect with communities and there's great uh, magazine type resources as well. Right. I, you know, I used to be a huge Twitter user, and I still do use it, but not nearly as much as I used to. Um, for one thing, I should clean out my account, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I'm just too lazy to do that, I guess, and I want to put the time to it. So then it gets, there's too much to wade through. You know, I really do need to clean it up. Um, but I find myself turning more and more to Google+. Plus. You know, all the communities that are available on Google+, Plus, we have our we have some Wells communities. We have the Wells Google Schools, and we have a Wells Apple, um, I don't know what it's called, what, but it has to do with Apple and Wells. Mm -hmm. Forgot the name of it. Um, it might be and, a Mac users. Yeah, and those are just Wells users, but then you expand from that, and I mean, Google Apps for Education users, I mean, there's so many groups for that, and, um, Google admins, if you're the administrator of Google in your school, there's, you know, communities for that. I belong to a lot of those and I, yeah, the networking through those things can help you um, tremendously when you're um, thinking about new equipment, when you're installing new equipment, when you're fixing old equipment, just about anything you could, um, you know, ask for, you can find a good group that would help you. So between Twitter and, um, and the, I don't know, I find Twitter, I find Twitter more, um, and maybe it's just who's in my group, but there's more education talk on Twitter than there is like in the Google communities. There's, there's that, but there's also a lot of, a lot of um, networking, infrastructure, um, building it kind of communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I we use, should I probably mention there's a, a Wells Office 365 community as well, started by Perry oh, Lynn, yeah. so lots of yeah. those. And then I have up on screen uh, techandlearning.com as well as edtechmagazine.com where they have a whole K through 12 section. Mm -hmm. So just regularly um, producing resources that will definitely jump in and help you at the point you are if you're struggling with, you know, networking side of things or implementing a solution or whatever, oftentimes they've got resources around that um, between those right. two magazines. So yeah, lots of good and, stuff. The tech and learning in particular, I, I, I love reading their, they have always a software section and a hardware section, mm -hmm. new stuff and, and websites and apps, you know, mm -hmm. so what's, what's coming out, they do a really good job of featuring what's coming out that seems to be attracting people to it and, and might be a, a good thing to look at. You know, I, I love it when um, some other people wade through all of them and give you their, <laughs> their picks, so to speak, so that, you know, you, you can start, you have a starting place to look. Definitely, so, definite advantage there. That. So very good. Well, Gail, I don't know. I feel kind of tired after hearing about all the things that keep you busy in the day in the life of Gail, the tech director. So I'm impressed with all the work you do and thankful for those around our Senate who fill that role of tech director in their various school settings. And hopefully um, this will, you know, offer some support and and guidance for those that are considering the role or whatever. Are you um, you're obviously not full time in that role. No, um, I think I'm. I think I'm. 
About 50-50. Okay. Yeah. Is that pretty For typical, years, people that you know? Um, yeah, I'm probably a little luckier than most. I think it's less than that in most places. For two wow. years, I was actually full-time. Not They weren't successive years, but uh, it worked out that they could fit it in the budget and the number of students and whatnot. So, and I will tell you this, that the professional de development in those two years just was way far and above what it usually is because I had really a lot of time to do that and to pull good things together. And um, I, so you're I was saying given what you presenting that. What you presented for your staff, your yeah, not your personal mm -hmm. pe professional development, but the what you were able to give to your yeah. staff, it pay, kind of paid right. for itself to have you yeah. in that full time role. It really, everybody it really did. Mm -hmm. It really did. I, that year uh, was the year that we took a class together, and I was the um, teacher of the class. It was a formalized online learning situation, but I was there with them on site. And the accumulated or the culminating project was that they had to create a website for their classroom. So I don't think that every probably would have happened the way it did had we not mm -hmm. had that that going on. So yeah, it really it really if you have somebody, of course, then your other teachers have to have the time to have the training too. It takes besides the tech coordinator, you the administrator, the principal is really key um, in supporting the tech and the learning that needs to go on. Without that, you you won't get very far. So very the good. administrators, kudos to the administrators who get it. That's important. Awesome. Awesome. Words of wisdom, Gail. Thank you so much for giving us a peek into a day in the life of a tech director. It's um, it's quite the responsibilities you carry there. So. It's a fun very job. Good. It's very fun because it is different. And I have the two aspects of my day when I'm fed up with working with my machines then I can work with people, <laughs> I, you know, and then I get to work with the kids. So, I, you know, it's different doing both. Those things are quite different. And, and uh, I enjoy that, that there's that variety. That's I always fun. think you should never completely give up the classroom because that's where you practice what you preach. There you go. And that makes you more effective yeah. as you're trying to help yeah. others have yeah. that experience. Yeah. That's why we're so fortunate to have you on Wells Tech because <laughs> you have that great classroom and tech director experience that you bring to us wow. on this semi-regular basis. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. I enjoy that. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to plow through the rest of this good stuff we've prepared for our um, viewers and listeners today, uh, starting with news in tech. And actually, it, I was almost uh, wanting to jump in there as you were talking about Google Plus communities because um, our news in tech is that a new Google Plus is rolling out. Have you seen the new Google Plus, Gail? No, I, I, I see, I've seen the new Hangout thing, and I have still used the classic mode myself, so mm -hmm. I haven't done that. Yeah, so they're coming out with um, a few changes, making it uh, look a little bit different, kind of following the, the change of the Google logo, and now they're changing the Google Plus. But um, interestingly, and I'll include a, a little video link or embedded video in the show notes as well, um, just reading the vibe as people are reacting to this change, um, I think there's a lot of people that say, oh, Google Plus, I wrote it off a long time ago. Who cares what they're doing? Do they still have users even? That kind of thing. And then there's this whole huge community of people that are very excited and committed to um, Google Plus because of that exact nature, Gail, that you described, the communities. And they talk about communities like what we have for our Office 365 Wells schools or our uh, Wells Google schools or Apple schools or whatever it is. Um, those kind of um, known communities, but also they have a lot of affinity group kind of communities on Google+. And so that seems to be where Google's uh, zeroing in and that's kind of their sweet spot is that community kind of feel. I actually took a course in the spring where we use Google Plus communities as our discussion forum, basically for the online class I was taking. And it was a really good fit um, to use that. So the community feature and uh, threads of discussion within communities and things like that seems to be really 
uh, taking off. And like I said, we'll have a link to this article. We'll have a video that talks uh, some about the changes to Google Plus as well. And that will be our news and tech segment for today. Um, and so then we move on and the next segment of our show is the uh, Wells Now, kind of a pulse of what's happening in Wells World. And um, entirely appropriate for this week, Gail, we haven't mentioned yet that it's Thanksgiving week, just two days away. Um, Wells has a new book out and it's called uh, 364 Days of Thanksgiving, published through Northwestern Publishing House and written by Pastor Andrew Shear. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Um, and I've actually heard a little bit about this. I don't know if you have, Gail, but um, Pastor Shear started a website, 364daysofthanksgiving.com. And he also has a very popular Facebook page. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes. And on a regular basis, he puts out um, blog posts, basically, and shares them via the Facebook page about things to be thankful for. And the reason he's got the title 364 Days of Thanksgiving is uh, some quote around people are only thankful on one day a year. They should be thankful all the days of the year. And so um, his challenge is to think of things you're thankful for that are unique each day of the year. And so that's a little bit a uh, different take on 364 Days of Thanksgiving because Oftentimes we're thankful for the same things over and over again. But if you put a little effort into it and perhaps read his blog post um, to inspire you and things like that, and now read his new book, which has come out from Northwestern Publishing, 364 Days of Thanksgiving. It even includes a journal within the book where you can write your things you're thankful for. Um, and interestingly, on the Heart to Heart um, website, Heart to Heart, um, dot com, which is part of Forward in Christ. Uh, they have an interview this month from Dan Nominson, who talks about the 364 days of Thanksgiving. So all of these things around the concept of being thankful and what better week to kind of give some thought to that and perhaps yeah. uh, take the challenge and start a thankful journal of your own where you actually are um, more, more aware and um, intentional about the things that you have to be thankful for. So all of that will be featured on our show website. And you know what? I have another video to feature. It seems like Martin's away. I think I'm going to just do something a little different and have videos all throughout the show. So um, check out the show notes at wellstech.wells.net for those links to the new book, the blog, the Facebook page, and to watch the video interview of Dan Nominson uh, talking about uh, 364 days of Thanksgiving. Sounds like right, a great Gail. idea. Yeah, I'm feeling very thankful for this podcast that led me to it. So there's yeah. something to be thankful for. Um, now it's time to be thankful for your pick of the week because I bet you have something good to share with us, Gail. Well, I have something pretty easy. Um, it's good, but easy. And um, Google constantly is coming out with new things. That's one cool thing about Google. They, they're certainly not complacent. So um, the thing that I wanted to talk about today was is called um, Google Voice Typing. And what Google Voice Typing is, let's see if I can do this again, share my screen. Find that. No. And it's oh, probably yeah. a Google Docs product, I bet. Yes, it is. Awesome. And, oops, there we go, voice typing. All right, can you see me? Yes, I can. All right, voice typing is a very simple concept. Um, I'm going to have to tell you a little bit about, and then I'm going to have to switch my microphone because it doesn't work with my earpiece. So. Um, I'll have to do that. But the idea is it's just a dictation um, program, but it's built right into Google Docs. And I love that because I've tried to use a lot of different apps with kids. And I, I visualize using this with kids who um, have some ideas, but typing slows them down. And 
for that reason, they could try voice typing. Um, I also like on the Google video that Sally will include in the show notes on voice typing, there are some really neat applications too, especially when you can now do um, split screen on your computer. So you could have voice typing, a Google Doc with voice typing open at the same time you have are watching um, a YouTube video, a, you know, any kind of video, or maybe you're listening to a podcast and doing some planning about what you're gonna say or what you like about it. So you can be talking your notes while you're watching what you're watching on the other half of the screen, which I think is a real um, handy application. So I'm gonna just show you that it's in tools. If you go up to tools, you see it right here, voice typing. All you have to do is click on it and it will type as you speak. And we'll show you that here. Amazing stuff. It's like magic. You just spoke and it typed what you said. Um, we definitely get the idea, Gail, and, and uh, I see, like you said, that you provided a, a link to a great video that demonstrates it as well. But wow, super simple to start. Go to Tools, Google Voice, and click on the microphone and speak your mind, and it will type it. And I noticed you uh, you right. told it when you wanted to put in a period, a question mark, a new paragraph, whatever. And my turn for a pick of the week, and mine is education focused, although anyone could take advantage of this, but um, as a, an effort um, in the education setting, uh, a new website was created, I believe last year was the first year for this, called hourofcode.com. And what they do is they pick a particular week of the school year and encourage schools to um, sign up and commit to introducing students to programming for at least one hour. Um, and their goal is to touch every student uh, with the introduction to programming. And um, you can do it for any age, actually. The, the programs are great. They say ages four to 104. Um, and they are supported by the website code.org. That's really where the programming uh, side of thing is housed. And just recently leading up to Hour of Code, which is gonna happen December 7th through 13th, code.org announced two new um, coding um, environments to do things with some kind of trendy popular things. They have um, some code to program Star Wars, um, new Star Wars movie coming out right around that same time December uh, 7th through 13th. I think it's coming out perhaps that week. I'm not sure. Um, but they, you can actually code um, something in the Star Wars environment, uh, which would be really appealing to a lot of um, students, I believe. And then um, also, they uh, just last week announced that they're going to have Minecraft as well, which I know many, many children and adults are excited about Minecraft. And I actually went out and played um, with the Minecraft interface. You can click try it now and a video comes up. We'll have that video on our show notes. Um, you pick whether you want to be Steve or Alex, and then you do things uh, with little code blocks, like um, moving forward a couple of spaces. And um, when you are done, you press run and you ch achieved what you were challenged to do um, in that code block. So um, a fun environment for students to learn to code and um, I think will be very, very popular. One of the reasons I wanted to feature it as well is because the video that's associated with it features a guy whose name in the, um, in the program and for Mojang is Jeb. He's very popular. Um, and Jeb is actually the creator of Minecraft. Um, and it's an interview with him and he kind of walks you through how to do the programming and stuff. So one more video to add to our lengthy uh, video uh, list this week on Wells Tech. If you want to see one of the creators of Minecraft, Jeb, uh, watch that video and let him introduce you to programming um, for, with Hour of Code and for um, Hour of Code with your students, I think you would uh, be a very popular teacher and students will be really motivated to do some Minecraft type things um, with programming. So check it okay. out. Me yet? I no. am hearing no. in and out. 
kind of in okay. and out. But I'm I'm hearing I'm I'm hearing right now, so I don't know what's going on. But yeah, okay. But, yeah, but okay. It's just repeating. I I can hear you, but then it repeats a good bit. I'm not quite sure why. Anyway, um, we will move on, and our next segment of the show is called Ministry Resources. And I wanted to um, share with you a ministry resource I came across recently. Um, and this one is from, let me just click share. And Gail, maybe you want to mute your mic because I do hear a lot of rattle. Okay. Um, so this one's from uh, a group, a Missouri Synod group called Lutheran, Hours Minist Lutheran Hour Ministries. And they've put together a new video series a man named Martin and this year for Reformation they released part one of this video series focusing on Martin Luther's life and I um, watched uh, the beginning section of this and I'm kind of a history buff and I thought it was really well done um, how they looked back at his life and the times and uh, events that led up to him um, making his bold statement and, and nailing the 95 thesis to the church door in Wittenberg and, and what happened after that kind of from a historical perspective this first section of a man named Martin um, so it is broken up into I believe five different sessions and then there's some bonus footage as well where they talk to people about specific things um, in Martin Luther's history. In addition to the video series they have provided Bible study to go along with it and um, there's also a booklet that you can download, A Treasure Revealed Martin Luther and the Events of the Reg Reformation. So all of this focus on Martin Luther as we approach the 500th anniversary um, of the Lutheran Reformation, the day that uh, we celebrate um, coming up in 2017, just two years away. And we'll include a promo video um, from this series, A Man Named Martin, uh, to introduce you to it and give you a little taste of what you can expect, along with the links to um, all of the videos in this part one of the series um, on our show notes page. So man, it's about time for you guys to grab some popcorn with all the wonderful videos we have to share with you this week. Um, a Man Named Martin just is a great one that you might want to take advantage of and uh, work through, read through some of the Bible story re study resources and things that they prepare. So check it out. And finally, Gail, I'm going to jump right into our featured video. After all these videos, I couldn't let it go by without having a featured video as well. And this one actually comes from our friends at the Wells Hymnal Project. Um, we're right at the end of our church year and uh, have recently celebrated Saints Triumphant and one of the most um, wonderful opportunities we have um, on Saints Triumphant is to sing the song Jerusalem the Golden. I know that's a favorite of many. Actually, the hymnal committee did a survey and it made it in the top 50 as far as favorite hymns among all those who responded to the survey. Um, what we have for you is a creative um, way that the hymnal committee has um, taken a, a performance of Jerusalem the Golden uh, in worship from the actual 2014 worship conference. And they overlaid it with some of the responses from the survey that they took as to people's feelings and um, experience with the Jerusalem the Golden hymn. And so we'll want to, sh to share that video in the show notes as well. Um, just a tremendous um, uh, version of Jerusalem the Golden. I think it was actually um, written, this particular um, version was written by Mr. Dale Whitty, um, who serves at Winnebago Lutheran Academy uh, in their music department and who uh, was commissioned by the worship conference to create this version for the orchestra that was there and, and choirs and things. And it's just beautiful, breathtakingly beautiful. Makes you long for Jerusalem the Golden, that's for sure. So be sure to tune in. Um, our show notes page is at wellstech.wells.net. Um, and you're going to find that video along with a whole lot of others on our current um, 
uh, show as we get it up on the website. You'll find ways to connect with us. We have um, Google+, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, all those different ways to connect. Plus, we have a very active listserv where you can uh, ask questions of a community of over um, 800 uh, Wells techies out there uh, across the globe and get answers to your technology and ministry questions. So uh, be sure to visit the web website, wellstech.wells.net. You can watch the show as well as the many videos that we've referenced throughout um, and this special video enhanced um, podcast. So how you doing, Gail? Can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, so we're definitely having some audio difficulties there. We appreciate, Gail, that um, you were able to join us for this show and that your audio works so we could learn about the day in the life of the tech director and um, really appreciate all the, the information and knowledge that you shared with us today. Thank you. And uh, we'll look forward to next week on Wells Tech when uh, Martin will be back in the co-host seat and he and I will be diving into Windows 10. 10. Have you upgraded to Windows 10 yet? Um, I did recently and Martin's upgraded as well. And so we're going to tell you about our experience, some of the new things that are available in Windows 10 and um, features and things that I think you'll find really helpful. And whether you're coming from Windows 7 or Windows 8.1, um, things are a little different. They're, it's kind of a mashup of the two and uh, has some new things as well. So we're going to spend some time looking and screen sharing our Windows 10 installs so that you can get a feel for how the system might work for you. So tune in next week. Um, and until then, we thank you very much for watching and listening to Wells Tech and ask you to join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Uh, thanks very much, Gail, and we'll look forward to having you on again in the near future. Blessings.